that'll wake you up. Welcome back. So today we're going to finish talking about errors and exceptions, and that's it. Maybe we'll get done a little early. Send you guys on your way for a well-deserved, if too late in the semester, week off. Um, okay, so last time we started to talk about Java exceptions, and we looked at two things. We looked at um, kind of what exceptions are, and we looked at the control structures that Java provides for working with exceptions, try catch, right? For handling exceptions that might occur in code that you write um, or work with. And then we talked a little bit about the types of Java exceptions. And so today, we're going to finish up the conversation about Java exception types. And then we'll talk about working with exceptions and actually generating your own exceptions. So how can you, last time we kind of talked about how to handle exceptions that occur in code that you're using. Today we'll talk about how to generate exceptions in code that you're writing. Because um, in some cases, you know, one of the reasons that we talk about exceptions, one of the reasons why Java and other languages have an exception uh, system, you know, is because there are certain places where it's the right thing to do, right? Um, and we've encountered a couple of those throughout the semester, and we haven't known what to do about it, and now we have a new tool at our disposal. And so we'll go back and look at some of those cases we encountered earlier and actually handle them properly. All right, so this is a review from last time. We, we looked at exceptions. We looked at try-catch. Um, we looked at how control flow is affected by try-catch. So that's the other thing that's really important to understand, when the exception gets thrown, how it's handled. And so that's something that you can review. Um, but what we were talking about kind of when we ended was that there are three types of exceptions in Java. So there are checked exceptions. These are exceptions that the compiler is actually going to help you uh, check. Checked exceptions have to be caught somewhere, so they have to be, if you use code that throws a checked exception, that exception has to be um, caught explicitly, okay? And the other thing about checked exceptions that I guess is important to understand, and I, maybe I wasn't as clear about this last time as I should have been, and we'll see this today, is the checked exceptions are generated using this throw keyword that we're gonna cover in a few minutes, okay? So checked exceptions are generated by the code. They're generated so the compiler knows that it's gonna happen because it sees this throw statement, and then the compiler can check to make sure that your code is handling them, right? Something has to catch a checked exception, okay? Unchecked exceptions are uh, many times thrown by errors, right? So when you try to dereference a null reference, or when you walk off the end of the array, or when, um, you know, you try to do an unsafe cast, right, a downcast or an upcast that doesn't work, um, Java will generate this exception automatically, okay? Um, so you were just going about your business writing this piece of code, you didn't realize that a reference was null, you tried to dereference it to call, you know, to string or hash code or whatever, um, and right at that point, an exception is going to be thrown, okay? Um, here the compiler can't help you. The Java compiler can't help you. There are newer, better languages in the world that can help you with this, uh, but Java just isn't capable of it. So essentially what, what Java ends up doing is just saying, you know, like again, we, we've looked, I can just dereference a null reference. At that point an exception will get thrown, but Java can't check your code to make sure that these exceptions don't occur. And so because of that, it doesn't know where they're gonna happen, and because of that, it can't make you or it doesn't make you handle them. So you don't have to wrap every piece of code that could throw a null pointer exception in a try-catch, because if you did that, you'd essentially have to wrap every piece of code that you ever wrote in a try-catch, because the compiler doesn't know where these are gonna happen. And the last type of exception are these errors, right? Um, and this, these are, you know, one way to think about these, these are sort of generated by the Java virtual machine that's running your code, right? If it runs out of memory, or if you're, you were cursed too far, um, and you, you, you blow your stack or whatever, these are, and these are usually not things that are recoverable, so not, we're gonna not talk about them very much. Okay. We also looked at, at ways to handle these, and this is sort of where we left off, but I wanna return to this topic because it's important, right? Errors you can kind of ignore, right? What we're really gonna focus on is how to handle unchecked exceptions and checked exceptions. So unchecked exceptions are, are the trickier category here, right? Because the compiler doesn't know they're gonna happen. And if you don't catch them, your code is going to crash. So remember, if nothing catches an exception, your code is going to crash. Java doesn't want your program to crash. That's why the compiler helps you with those checked exceptions to make sure they actually get caught. But the unchecked exceptions, the only real way to get rid of these is to find them. These are mistakes, programmer errors. 
And the only way to find these is to do testing, basically, right? Exercise your code in a way so that it generates these before you ship it to a customer, before you deploy it, before you publish it on the App Store, whatever, right? The only way to find these is to run the code, right? Because they're, because they're essentially, the, like I said, the compiler is not helpful here. The compiler is like, I got no idea where these are gonna happen. So the compiler will happily compile your code with a ticking time bomb in there, some place where an unchecked exception could be generated that will cause your program to crash, okay? The only way to find, to, to fix these is to find them. So that's what we try to do. Checked exceptions, again, here now the compiler is gonna force you to do something about it. So the compiler knows that you're calling a function that calls another function that calls another function that throws a certain type of exception. And so the compiler is going to help. It's gonna tell you, and you guys may have already seen this, when particularly as you start working on your final project and you start using code from libraries or other places, you know, you get an error message that will prevent you from compiling the code. because so the compiler will say, you know, you have to handle this exception. You either have to handle it or you have to, um, essentially there's a way to kind of um, wave your arms and say, I'm not gonna handle it, I'm just gonna throw it out of this function, at which point something else has to catch it, okay? Um, so here, you know, the normal thing to do is to try to do something graceful. Now the alternative was to crash, okay? If you end up crashing anyway, you haven't really improved the situation very much, but, you know, retry the operation, uh, try to go on if you can, you know, uh, ask the user for more input, right? It really depends on the scenario, right? Depends on it, and if you guys run into questions about this as you're working on your final project, ask, because this is really context specific. Depends on what caused the error, right? Okay. So, we also pointed out, and, and you know, some of the homework problems are designed to reinforce this, that, that exceptions in Java are objects. They are not, there's only something a little bit special about them, and that's what, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, right? Um, I guess what's special about them is how they interact with these control, control structures, right? So the thing that you put inside that catch statement, that type has to be a throwable, right? You can't catch something that's not throwable. So Java uses the type system to make sure that the things that you catch and the things that we'll throw in a few minutes when we look at throw are throwable objects. But other than that, these exceptions fit in with the rest of the Java type system perfectly. They're all inheriting from throwable, okay? And this means that you can do useful things with them, just the way you would with other types of Java objects. You can print them, um, you can, they have a couple of helpful, uh, helper methods, like get message, which gives you a little bit of a string representation of the, and they have this uh, really helpful method that will tell you how your code got there. Okay. So, you know, and, and we talked a little bit about, you know, um, how to catch exceptions and stuff like that. I'm not gonna go through this. Maybe we'll come back and use this uh, little playground in a minute, okay. So, let's talk a little bit about other things that you can do with exceptions, and let's talk about throw, okay? So throw is the last piece of this puzzle, and that we have not seen yet, okay? So try catch was our control structure for allowing us to execute some code inside a try block that could throw an exception, and then register some, what, sometimes what are called exception handlers, code that's gonna run if a certain problem occurs. So if that network library that you're using can't access the internet, or if, you know, the there's something wrong with the uh, input that the user provided or whatever, you can run some code to respond, okay? The last bit of this that we haven't talked about yet is uh, a statement called throw, okay? So throw allows me, so you see it down here on line nine, throw is a, um, it looks kind of like a function. You can think about it as a function, but it's actually a reserved word in Java. It takes an argument, that argument has to be something that's throwable. So that argument has to be a reference to a Java object that inherits from throwable, okay? Throw throws an exception. This is how you generate exceptions in Java, particularly checked exceptions. This will trigger exception handling. So what I'm doing here right now is I'm doing this inside my catch statement. So this is something that you can do. So imagine what you wanna do is you basically wanna record that an exception happened, but you're not sure what to do about it, okay? So what I did here is I put the code 
that generates the exception inside my try block, if it generates this particular type of exception called a URI syntax exception, I'm gonna run the code on line seven. But then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna immediately throw the ex same exception, okay? So if you throw an exception inside a catch block, it's as if the exception hadn't been handled. So essentially, this is now gonna throw the exception out of the try statement, out of this function, meaning that something else is gonna have to catch it somewhere else, all right? So throw is, you know, again, the last piece of this puzzle. So we had try catch for handling exceptions, and we have throw for generating exceptions. And there are places where this, the right thing to do is not to return a value, not to continue executing code, to throw an exception. So let's go back and, and look at this one, right? So when we were designing this class before, we encountered this problem where, you know, we had a case where we were creating a storage class object, and the question was, what happened when someone passed us an argument a size to that object that was negative? What were we supposed to do at that point, right? So before, we really didn't have a good mechanism for dealing with this. It was like, I basically have to kind of like, you know, I could not initialize the storage class object. I can't return null to indicate that there was a problem because the constructor always returns a reference to the newly created object. So the only, I, I have to do something else, right? At the time, we had no other option. Now we do, right? So let's look at the right way to handle this, okay? So here's my storage class, this is kind of good. This is like a string storage, it basically stores strings. This is not an interesting class, not a good, and not in a class that you would necessarily create. But, what should I do here? Somebody gave me an argument for the size of this that is clearly invalid. Okay, so what do you, what would you guys suggest? What do you think we should try? Anybody have any ideas? Okay, so I, I like the first half of that, so we're gonna throw an exception, right? Then the question is, what kind of exception should we throw, right? So there's no array that I'm indexing. So the suggestion was to throw an array index out of bounds exception, right? Um, but there's no array that I'm indexing here, okay? So we're on the right track. We're gonna throw an exception. Now the question becomes, what kind of exception should we throw? Yeah, how about, so, so, and, and again, I don't ex wouldn't expect you guys to know this. You might, like, Google it and say, okay, if somebody passed an invalid parameter to my function, what should I do? Or my constructor, what should I do? And you'd probably someone find some advice online that would say, hey, Java has a built-in argument that is expressly designed for this, called a legal argument exception. A legal argument exception is an unchecked exception, right? Again, there's no way for, you know, if it was checked, you'd have to wrap pretty much every piece of code that you wrote inside a try-catch statement, and we don't want that. Why is, so, so a legal argument is an unchecked exception, why? Why isn't it a checked exception? Wouldn't it be better for the compiler to be able to help us with this? I'm about to throw it. A legal argument exceptions are only ever thrown. They're not generated by code that you run like an array index out of bounds exception or a null pointer exception. Why is an illegal argument exception an unchecked exception? As opposed to a checked exception, yeah. Yeah, so, so one thing is the compiler doesn't know the semantics of every function I call, right? But there was, a, there was a difference that, so that's part of it, and that's correct, but there was a difference that we drew between the unchecked exceptions and the checked exceptions. So the checked exceptions were the result of something about the world being out of whack like the network was down, a file that I needed didn't exist. The unchecked exceptions were typically the result of what? No pointer exception, class cast exception, or index out of bounds exception. These occur because, yeah, programmer error, okay? And here, look, I've got documentation on this function. I probably have this up on, you know, I have this up online somewhere for you to read. So when you use my code, you're expected to read the documentation. 
that says that the size of the string storage must be positive. If you pass me an argument that doesn't conform to that, I am well within my rights to throw an illegal argument exception. So let's do that. Um, let's throw an illegal argument exception. This exception type is just built right into Java. You don't have to import anything to get it. It's just right there. And then usually let's put in a message. Uh, let's say something like string storage size must be positive. I think check style is going to whine at me about something. Oh. All right. Oh, sorry. New. <laughs> there we go. I've been writing too much. All right, so now you'll see what happens when I try to create, so this was, this is not an error in compilation, this is a runtime error that occurred when I ran the code. And the error that I got was an illegal argument exception, string storage side must be positive, and that reason that where this happened was on line 16, right? I tried to create a string storage with a negative size, right? If I try to create one with a positive size, I'm good, nothing happens, right? No bad things happen. And actually, let's make this even a little bit better, um, reformat this. Let's give the user a little, even a little bit more information about what they did wrong. We'll put the storage size in the error message so I know what I did, right? This is kind of what, uh, array index out of bounds does. It tells you kind of like what the size of the array was and what the index you were trying to use. That's helpful. Okay. So again, this is now the right thing to do. This is the right way to write this code. When you're in a constructor, when you're in certain types of functions, um, if somebody gives you an argument that really prevents you from making forward progress, if you're sitting there scratching your head being like, I don't know what to do if this argument has, doesn't have a certain property, right? We might have other rules about the storage size. We might have a maximum, like the maximum amount, the size of the storage size class is 256 or something like that, and I could check that here too, right? Obviously, one of the things that, you know, came up as part of this discussion that becomes very important here is making sure that we actually have documentation for our string storage class. I need to know how big it is, right? Or, sorry, the person who calls this function, who calls my constructor, needs to know what the rules are about the arguments. If I don't tell them, then I'm getting into a little bit of a kind of a suspicious, suspicious territory here, right? Because it's like, Oh, I don't know what the, I don't know, maybe it has a maximum size, guess, right? I don't want to find out at runtime. All right, any questions about this, this example, okay? Notice that we were able to throw the, a lot of exceptions in Java will take, the constructor of the exception will take a parameter that's a string, and that becomes the message that, uh, gets associated with that particular, uh, type of exception. So that's pretty normal. A lot of exceptions have this pattern in their constructor. Sometimes it takes more than one argument, but frequently it would take one argument, which is a string. Notice also that I don't have to wrap my string storage, my call to string storage on line 18 in a try catch. So this is an unchecked exception. And any, any questions about this? Okay, good. So this is, and, and this is essentially the keyword that we use. I mean, now should have, the slide should have been a couple, couple slides earlier. Um, this is how we throw exceptions in Java, right? So we can see we're using it here, throw an exception out of our, uh, constructor. Uh, we also used it back here to throw an exception out of a catch statement. So if you're inside a catch statement and you throw a new exception, or the code inside the catch statement throws a new exception. So I can have code in here. You might be wondering, like, what if the code inside my catch statement does something dumb? It's gonna generate an exception, and if you're inside a catch statement, that exception exits the try block, right? So it does not get caught again. It doesn't matter if there are any other catch statements below it that would have caught that exception. If you throw an exception inside a catch block, that exception pops out of the try catch statement. It needs to be handled somewhere else, or the, or the code will crash, right? So let's, 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 tr actually, let's try this here. So remember, I don't have to catch, I don't have to catch unchecked exceptions. I can catch unchecked exceptions. So let's do this. We'll catch the illegal argument exception E. And then we'll do system.out.println. Oops. Um, there you go. But now let's see what happens if I say, you know, object. Um, and then we'll do it.hashcode. Yeah. So now you'll see 
what happened? I entered my catch block. Let me put a print statement up at the top so we can see this. So I entered my, no, it's not even gonna print that for me because the exception got thrown. So I enter my catch block, um, but before I can actually exit, I make another mistake, right? This generates a null pointer exception that gets thrown out of the catch block. All right. So, you know, again, here are some guidelines for using throw, right? Um, first of all, use throw when you can't figure out what to do next. That should, that should have been on the slide. So when do you throw an exception? When something, particularly when some, you know, input to your function is bad, or when some condition is sort of prevents you from making forward progress, and there's not something better to do, right? You know, we, we, we really found that in our constructors. We can't return null. Even returning null wouldn't be the right thing to do, because that, then the, the code that called me might go on and think that things were okay. Like, the programmer made a mistake, I'm gonna signal it. If you need to throw an exception, look for an exception class that's a good fit. So, for example, if I go back here, I could throw an exception here. I could just throw an exception. Okay? Now, notice something here, though. Exception is a checked exception in Java, right? So now my class needs to declare that it says throws exception. We'll come to this in a sec. And then I actually have to catch it down here. All right, and the whole thing has gotten, you know, kind of ugly, right? This will work, but the right thing to do here was to use the built-in, um, illegal argument exception, which I don't, means that I don't have to declare that it's thrown I can still catch it in the same way down here, um, but in this case, the right exception type is one that's already built into the language, right? You can create your own exceptions. Exceptions in Java are just objects. Here's how you create a new exception. And actually, this is all you have to do, right? Your class doesn't really have to do anything. Exception actually has a built-in constructor that takes a string and stuff like that, so if I wanted to create a new exception, that extends an existing exception, I can just do this, right? And now I can throw instances of my new exception. So again, let's go back to our playground. We'll do this just for fun. Let's say I do, oh, let's declare a new type of exception, public class string bad size exception extends exception. And now what we can do is I can throw a bad size exception. Now again, um, oh, oh right, it doesn't take a string, okay. Let's do this, let's say, let's give it a constructor. And all we'll do is call super with that string. All right, now my problem is similar to the one I had before, where I need to declare that I throw this, this is now a checked exception, and down here I can catch it. Uh, throws, there we go, okay. There's an example of using a custom exception. We talk about one last piece of this puzzle that's kind of cool, actually, and potentially very useful. So Java's try-catch statement supports one additional type of block. And that block is called final. Finally does kind of what it implies. The code in the finally block will always run. It will run if there's no exception, and it will run after any catch block. So if you put code in finally, you know that it will always be the last thing that gets executed. So if there's no error, what will happen here is I'll see start done finally. If could error throws an error, I'll see start catch finally. Okay? If could error throws an error, I exit the try block, I enter the catch statement, but if I have a finally block, I always enter the finally block every single time, right? So again, now, now I have a piece of code that throws an error half the time. Here's what happens when it throws an error. And here's what happens when it does. All right, so either way, that finally block is always, always executed. This can be a good place to, like, do some cleanup, some logging, or whatever. I mean, this is a, this is a pretty useful statement, 
right? If you find yourself duplicating code between your catch blocks and your try statement, um, your try block, put it inside of final. That's a, a better way to do it. All right, so I think actually, before we go on, I just, you know, we're almost, we're actually almost done, which is great. We'll finish up a little bit early today. Any questions about try, catch, finally, throw, Java's exception mechanism? Probably a good idea to go over this now, since you guys will be tested on this, but it'll be after break. And of course, you come back from Thanksgiving, haven't forgotten everything, hopefully. Um, any questions about this? Yeah, yeah, so great, uh, okay, so the question is, if the code in the finally block is always executed, why don't I write it outside, right? Um, so imagine that my, imagine I don't have a catch statement, right? So the exception might be thrown out of this function, right? So actually, let's go back and look at that. All right, where's my little playground here? Okay, so let's imagine that I don't have this catch statement, okay? And it's hard to see because it's not printing when there's an exception. So actually, hold on. Let's do this. Let's wrap this in another try catch. All right. Just to make the playground happy so it doesn't hide information from us. Okay, there we go. So now there's two, there's still two cases, okay? If could error doesn't throw an error, I get to the done state and then I get to finally. But if could air room, I'm flipping coins here, there we go. Even if I'm about to exit the try statement without catching the exception, the finally still runs, right? So let's imagine what happens if I put this code down here. So let's put a final statement. So now you'll see, if I exit the try statement without um, generating an exception, I get there. If I don't, I don't, right? So see the difference? So here what happened is, could error through an exception? That exception was not caught by that inner try block. It wasn't caught until the outer try block, but the finally still runs, right? So even if I'm not going to drop below the try statement, the finally code will still run. Kind of the nice thing, and it always runs. Yeah. What if there's an error in finally? Okay, yeah, let's try that. What do you guys think? Let's just do my favorite. This is so easy. Baba, I really wish you wouldn't let me do that, but you do, and so I'm going to take advantage. Um, what do we think happens here? Where does this error end? Up. So essentially, it finally throws an error, I exit the try statement, and that error gets thrown out of the entire try statement. So here what happens is, I got to, into my finally block, it threw an error, I didn't drop below the try statement, because finally was throwing an error, and I ended up in the catch block of my outer, my outer try statement. Yeah, great question. Now, actually, there's another interesting question here, right, that we can try to, we can kind of try to figure out. So here, here's the question. Let's say that my try block is throwing in, let, let's say that my could error function throws an error, right? So I'm throwing one type of exception. And now, let's say my finally block, I actually don't even know the answer to this question, we'll find out together. My finally block throws an error. So the question is, which exception is going to be thrown out of this statement? Let's run this a few times and see if we can figure it out. And actually, hold on, I need to change this because it's not gonna allow me to tell. So let's say, um, and, okay. Oh. I'm struggling today, there we go. Let's 
else can you do? Uh, what am I doing wrong here? <laughs> What's that? Oh, do I need to initialize it? Oh, there we go. Thanks. <laughs> uh, it's been a long week. All right. All right, so let's see here. This is interesting. No matter how many times I run this, I'm never seeing an array index out of bounds exception. Okay. Now let's take this out, and you'll see that I see my array index out of bounds exception. So that's actually pretty interesting, right? So what it means is that if I throw an exception, so what happened here is could error half the time is going to throw an array index out of bounds exception. I run my finally block, because I always run it after try. My finally block throws a null pointer exception, and the error that gets thrown out of the statement is actually the last one that gets generated. Okay. So safe to say, one thing to keep in mind is be careful what you put in your finally block. Right? Your finally block should probably only do things that you're very sure are not going to cause a problem. Right? Finally block should not be filled with a lot of code, because the finally block generates its own exception then I've essentially lost information about the first exception that's happened, right? The only thing I find out about in my catch block is the second one. Really interesting. I think actually the, well, anyway, I'm not gonna go into that. It's interesting. All right, any other good, these are great questions. Any other questions about try catch? All right, so let me, let me point out one interesting, uh, this would be sort of where we leave off before break. So let me point out one interesting thing you can do with try catch. All right. Um, so there are times, and th this this code example is actually from a previous semester. So I don't think you guys actually had to do anything like this on the MP, but maybe you did. Um, so here's an example where I'm parsing some JSON. Right. So I got some JSON from somewhere, maybe from an Internet API endpoint or something like that, and I'm parsing it. Okay, and I'm, so I'm going along, and essentially here's what I'm doing. So I parse it into a JSON object here. And now I'm going, I'm essentially sort of unpacking the JSON, right? So I'm going key by key. I'm basically saying I'm looking for a metadata key. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And then if it doesn't have that, I need to return some sort of failure message, right? It means I got a, what I'm expecting is an object that has a metadata key, and that metadata leads to another object that has a width key, okay? And so I essentially, and, and imagine that my, I was, had to do this for several levels. So essentially, one at a time, I'm peeling off objects from this, you know, nested JSON structure, and I'm continuing to check to make sure they have the structure that I expect. Well, this gets really repetitive. You can already see it's repetitive, right? Essentially, I keep having to check here and make sure that it has this. The reason for this is that if I go on, if I don't do this check here and go on and do this, and info is null, I'm going to get an error, right? Or info is an empty object, okay? So here's what I can do instead. And this is actually, you know, I hope we can agree that this is a little bit cleaner and more clear. What I did is I wrapped the whole statement inside a try catch. So here's where I parse the JSON object, and then here I get the first field that I'm looking for, which I think is going to lead me to another object, and here's where I get the second field that I'm looking for, which I think is going to lead me to a field that has the type int, and then I get that as int. Now any one of these calls can fail. It's possible that the response I got isn't JSON and can't be parsed, so it's possible that the parser.parse can fail, or the get JSON as JSON object can fail. Maybe what I got is a JSON array instead of a JSON object. It's possible that line five can fail if the JSON object doesn't have a key named metadata, and it's also possible that line six can fail if the object that metadata leads me to doesn't have a key named width. And it's also possible that line seven can fail if that width can't be parsed as an int. Maybe it's a string, okay? So there are like six or seven different ways in which this piece of code can fail. But I kind of don't care, right? I don't care how, how it's going to fail, right? Because I'm going to do the same thing 
in all these cases. I'm basically gonna, maybe I throw my own exception, or maybe I return null, or some value that's gonna indicate that things went wrong, right? It's basically like, either I find out the information I was looking for from the JSON, or I don't. In my world, the, you know, it's binary, whether or not this succeeds or not. And so, by putting this all inside a try-catch, I don't have to worry about handling errors at every step. I just handle them all in one place. Okay, so this can lead to much, much more readable code, right? So we go from this to this, right? You know, and again, I'm not even like, I'm not even handling all the errors here. I'm not handling the error that can happen here if it's not an int. I'm not handling the error that can happen here if it's not a, a JSON object. There's even some errors built in here that, uh, that this isn't handling, that this does handle. Okay, any questions about this stuff before you guys head out for break? All right, so, just a couple of announcements before you guys head out. Um, so today's homework problem is actually uh, due on Monday night when you get back, all right? It uh, covers material that we won't get to until that class. Um, you know, please, you know, I hope you have made some progress on your final project this week. If you don't have a partner like this is a problem. Um, so please post on the forum and get started, because there's a checkpoint when you get back. Um, hope you guys have a wonderful Thanksgiving break. Travel safely. Enjoy time with family and friends. I will look forward to seeing you when you return.